Okay, we'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, we're going to do an overview of 1 Corinthians. And I just did it like I did Romans. You've got two pages there. One is an outline, and the other one are some what I'd call key verses. So we we'll go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Start looking through it. We mentioned with Romans that there's that outline of sound doctrine that's in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that uh, all, doc all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And we mentioned that there's that pattern in there where Romans gives you the doctrine, then you've got Corinthians has the uh, reproof, and then the correction in Galatians, and then the same thing with Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, where you've got the doctrine in Ephesians, the reproof in Philippians and the correction in Colossians and all that really means is that the doctrine is given in the, in the first book and then the second book is um, the correction of the practical application. It's a failure by the church to uh, correctly apply that doctrine that was in the previous book and so Paul ends up correcting that and then the next one is the correction where they where they've strayed away from the doctrine that was taught and he's correcting them on the doctrine. So since Corinthians, since Romans was the doctrine of faith, and so then Corinthians is covering the practical application of that, uh, the Corinthian church was far from doing a good job as far as following the doctrine of faith. If you go over to chapter 3, verse 1, we can see the state of the Corinthian church. When he writes to them, he says there in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So the state of the Corinthian church is that they're carnal. It's a lot like what we would see today in the church. I mean, you, you look at things, sin, sins, lust of the flesh that are committed uh, in the world, and you compare what Christians do to the world, and it's very similar. I mean, other than going to church and professing to be a Christian, a lot of people just live the same way uh, if they are a Christian as opposed to people who are not Christians. And that was really how the Corinthians are. If you go back to chapter 2, you can see Paul, uh, because re really when it comes to, and it's a good thing to keep in mind, when you're dealing with people and they, they want to talk about religion or the Bible, Scripture, or you know their religion, whatever they want to talk about related to God, you got to know where they are spiritually. Uh, God's will is for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So the first thing is to have salvation, to trust in Jesus' death as atonement for your sins. Once you believe that, then you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, and then the Holy Spirit can teach you the things of God so that you come into the knowledge of the truth. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't receive them. We'll see that in chapter 2, that the natural man cannot receive the things of God. So you have to know where a person is. If, if, they're not, if they've never believed the gospel, then you can't go into doctrines like we saw in Romans, dead to sin and alive to Christ, living in the Spirit, presenting your body a living sacrifice, all the practical application in Romans 12 and 13, um, you, you know, the revelation of the mystery. You can't learn you know, right division. You, you won't be able to come into the knowledge of the truth if you haven't believed because you don't have the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians, because they were so carnal, because their behavior was just like the world, Paul had to look at them and say, where are they? I don't, I'm not even sure if these people are saved. And that's what he says there in chapter 2, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. Uh, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul didn't really know, based on their behavior being just like the world, he didn't really know if they were saved or not. And so he had to first decide, 
you know, if they're not saved, if they haven't believed the gospel, then I can't go into any sound doctrine for them because they, the natural man can't receive that. I have to make sure they're saved first. That's what he's saying. First, I determined to know, you know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Is that in you? Do you have faith in His death as atonement for your sins? If you don't, then I can't, I can't go on from there. We have to establish that basis, the foundation of Jesus Christ, faith in His shed blood as atonement for sins. That's what that verse means. A lot of Christianity will take that verse and they'll say that that's all that matters. You know, all, all that matters, all Paul needed to know is that they're saved and that's all that matters. And, I mean, sure, that's true as far as having eternal life is concerned, uh, but this isn't a, a statement of faith. Rather, it's a statement of, you know, wondering if they have faith. It's wondering if it's not him saying that's all that matters. It's that's what matters first. If you believe in Jesus' death as atonement for your sins, then you've got that foundation of Jesus Christ laid. You've got the indwelling Holy Spirit. And now we can move on into greater sound doctrine. And, and so that's, that's really, you can see the, in the Corinthians here, uh, their behavior isn't, isn't what Christian behavior should be. So he's correcting. It's the practical application. The problem is not understanding and applying Romans doctrine, not believing that they're dead to sin alive to Christ, not believing that grace is given to them and the Holy Spirit's given to them so that they do not have to be servants of sin anymore and serve the lust of the flesh, but they can yield your, their members over unto God and allow uh, walk in the good works that God has for them to walk in and walk in the Spirit. So, you know, the, the, and so when you, but when you look at it, when you look at what the chap the book starts at back in chapter 1 here you can see him at first thanking God for the Corinthians and this is you know people who will tell you that you have to sure faith in Jesus blood is great and you have life eternal life but you've got to have works to demonstrate it. and if you don't have works you can lose your salvation people who do that I, I like to take him to the to the Corinthians because they're an example of people who did not have the works that follow the faith uh, as we get into the chapters, you'll see them doing things. He says, he says that this particular sin in chapter 5 is so bad that it's not even named among the pagans. Even the unbelievers out there, the Gentile unbelievers who are just serving their own flesh, they don't do the bad things that you're doing. But yet, when Paul starts the book of Corinthians, he doesn't say, well, you don't have the works to go with the faith, so you're not saved. He doesn't say that. Look at, look at how he says there when he starts there in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Now verse 2 says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. So he's saying that basically the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you. We realize that you've trusted in the gospel for salvation. And just based on that fact, not based on any works, good or bad, we can see that you are, as he says in verse 2, you're the church of God, you're sanctified, you're called to be saints. Uh, he thanks God in verse 4 for the grace of God bestowed upon him, uh, upon the Corinthians. And so it really goes to show you that works has nothing to do with your salvation. Uh, once he's established that they believe the gospel, he knows they're saints, that they have eternal life. Uh, that issue is settled. And it doesn't matter, I mean, certainly it matters as far as their lifestyle, but it doesn't matter in terms of salvation what they do after that. The sin in chapter 5 did not affect their salvation. They're still saints, even though the sin that they're doing in chapter 5 is something that's not even named among the pagans. Uh, so the issue, of course, when we talked about Romans, we found that the issue of your salvation by faith in Jesus Christ uh, was established by the time you get to Romans 5. It's a, it's a done deal and that he's moving on from there. And the Corinthians, he's established that they're saved, and now, but their problem is, because of their carnality, he can see that they're not living out 
the doctrine of Romans. And so the dead, the sin, and the life of Christ that he starts at in Romans chapter 6, they're not living that out. And so that's the purpose of the book. Uh, so in chapter 1, your first, the first point on your outline I've got is uh, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 5. And I put down there, uh, stop following men and start following sound doctrine for today. Uh, that's, their, that's their problem. They, they're living carnally just like the, the pagans are. And you say, well, why are they doing that? If they're saved, if they've got the indwelling Holy Spirit, why, would they, why wouldn't they be different? And the reason is because they're not utilizing the Holy Spirit within them. They're not allowing the Holy Spirit to teach them the sound doctrine of God's Word rightly divided. Instead, they're following after men. We see that in chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 11. This is the main problem that they have. Uh, so, you know, it goes to show you that the practical application, when you see sin in people's lives, a sinful lifestyle, you don't try to correct. It's really, the sinful lifestyle is just a symptom of a deeper problem. And you don't say, well, I'm just going to stop doing that sin. The way you correct the problem is you go back to the cause, and the cause is not having sound doctrine built up in the inner man. He says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So you see the problem here, the reason they're not following the sound doctrine is that they're following men. Notice there are four men listed in verse 12. There's Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ. Uh, a lot of, one of the criticisms that we get as a right dividing church is that people will tell us that you're just following Paul. Um, you know, you're following men and you should be following Christ. You should be following what Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. According to this verse here, uh, you shouldn't be following any of them. You should not be following Paul. Uh, he's a man. You should not even be following Christ, it says. Now, as, as far as, you know, as the, the man part of him, of course, you should be serving Christ as far as the doctrine that he's been given to us today. But the point is, you don't follow man. You follow, you follow God and his word. That's what we are to follow. And so even though you know, Paul would represent the, the sound doctrine for today, and that's what we should be following, the doctrine, but we should not be following Paul. Paul was not crucified for you, he says. We should not be following Apollos, the guy who is eloquent in the scriptures. Don't follow the theologian. We wouldn't be following Cephas, who is uh, Peter. We wouldn't be following um, you know, the, the early part of Acts there. And then we wouldn't be following Christ. We wouldn't be following what he taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, certainly we follow Paul's doctrine, but we don't follow Paul. And so that's the problem here is they were following men. And by being in these different groups and following men, um, all of them are incorrect in doing that. We should follow, we should follow um, the doctrine. Now, Paul does say later on, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, so that's really a following of his doctrine, though. And then Paul is an example of someone who has followed that doctrine. And so he gives that good example. But as far as just solely following what a man, uh, what a man does, they shouldn't be doing that. Rather, they should be following the doctrine that God has given them through the Apostle Paul. And so that's, that's really the root of all you know, going astray from the sound doctrine that God gives us through the Apostle Paul is following men, what men say, rather than what God says through His Word rightly divided. And so that's really what's going on here in chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 5. He attacks the problem at its root. It's stop following men, stop having these divisions, rather follow God's word today, rightly divided. Uh, the key verse I, I wrote down for that, um, there are a few verses I wrote down, chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. A key verse to keep in mind that water baptism is not for today. Then down in verses 22 through 24, uh, I wrote down that Jews need a sign, but Greeks need wisdom. Uh, that's a reference to the flesh, how God has made 
the mind of a Jew versus God is how God has made the mind of a Gentile, that we think differently. And that it says there in verse 22, the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, that's why when Jesus came, they would say to him, show us a sign and we will believe. Well, he already showed them signs, but then they still didn't believe. Well, they said, you know, keep showing us signs. They were looking for signs to believe. The Greeks, on the other hand, they're into wisdom. And that's why you'll see a lot of philosophies, and we see that today in America, um, all these philosophies that are out there. And really, when you look at, like, the theory of evolution in our, in our schools, is really a religion that's being taught to our kids to follow rather than following God's Word. But yet it's a, it's a wisdom it's, it's something to explain where we all came from. It's Instead of looking for a sign from the heavens to show us how everything came about, they're looking for wisdom. So then they come up with this theory, and they're going to believe in this theory. Uh, it's just the mindset there. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But God uh, doesn't give you either one. It says in verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified. So instead of giving you some great wisdom that if you take this four years in seminary school, you will be saved, God doesn't do that. And he also doesn't say, here's a sign of God in the heavens, so now you'll believe that too. He doesn't do that either. Uh, but he saves people today, it says, through Christ crucified. So unto the Jews, that's a stumbling block. They're looking for the sign. They're looking for a sign, and so they stumble at that. And unto the Greeks, it's foolishness. It's, you know, well, that's, that's silly. Why would I believe that? But, in verse 24, unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, uh, you see that you've really got three groups there. You've got the Jews who in, the, in their fleshly mind would look for a sign. And then you've got the Greeks who in their fleshly mind would look for wisdom. And then you've got the third group, both Jews and Greeks, those who are those who would have faith in God and faith in the gospel to believe in Christ crucified. Uh, that's that third group there. So it's another a key verse to keep in mind, especially when you're dealing with other people. Uh, later on in Corinthians, Paul will say to the Jews, I became a Jew, and to the Greeks, you know, he says he became all things to all men that they may believe. And if you know what their mindset is, well, then you can uh, show them, you know, Christ crucified against that mindset. And... So, um, and then another key verse is verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's the result of this, because if the Jews, if God just gives, the, gives them a sign and they believe, well now, you know, they think, well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm pretty special that God would speak to me by giving me this sign. And then the Greeks... Uh, if God would just give them some, you know, four years of seminary school or some advanced theological training in order for them to have eternal life, then the Greeks could boast in that. They'll say, well, yeah, because I'm smarter than everybody else. I took all this in. I got the wisdom, so now I'm saved. Um, neither one is how he does it. He does it by uh, Christ crucified. It's a simple message to believe. And... And the reason is, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The Jews can't glory in God's presence, saying, I'm saved because of this great sign. The Greeks cannot glory in his presence, saying, I'm saved because of this great wisdom. Rather, we are all um, have to come to God humbly, realizing I'm a sinner, I'm not righteous in myself, and I trust in Jesus' death. He did it all, and that's why I'm here. Uh, so there's your... your uh, no flesh can glory in its presence, one of the key verses there. And when you understand all of that, then it gives you the basis for believing what God and His Word says. Because really when you look at denominations, religion, things that are man's views, that are contrary to God and His Word rightly divided, all that is really is an issue of pride. It's an issue of, in this case, you know, the Greek side of it, looking after wisdom. It's saying, well, I've got this wisdom, so now I can get to God through that. And then you end up rejecting God and His Word because you're, you're prideful in what you believe. And so when you understand that these divisions among following men and following teachings of, you know, following what man says rather than following what God says and wanting to do things your own way, when you understand that's just an issue of the flesh trying to glory in God's presence, then you come down and you're, you're brought low and you're humbled so that you understand, well, just like I was saved, by faith in Jesus' death as atonement for our sins, 
then I am sanctified or I grow up in the doctrine, come into the knowledge of the truth through, uh, through faith in God as well, through faith in Christ to bring me into that position. So uh, the point is stop following men and start following the sound doctrine. And the way you do that, the next point in your outline is chapter 2, uh, the rest of chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Uh, your first fill in the blank there is that God reveals today's doctrine through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We talked about that a little earlier. And you see that down there in um, verse 10. Talking about the things of God there in chapter 2, verse 10. He says, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Uh, so, you know, us being flesh cannot understand the deep things of God ourself, but we do have a Spirit, and the Holy Spirit given unto us can communicate those things of God to us through, the Holy Spirit communicates to our Spirit so that we may know. That's what it says there. The Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Then verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And then down in verse 16, that last phrase, he says, we have the mind of Christ. So when you believe the gospel, you've got the indwelling Holy Spirit, you have the mind of Christ. Now it's up to you to, by faith, allow the Holy Spirit to teach you the sound doctrine that God has for you today in Paul's epistles. And so that's... So first chapter was getting away from man's doctrine. Chapter 2 now, going into God's sound doctrine through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And uh, key verses I mentioned in, on, on the handout there is uh, verses 7 and 8 in chapter 2. Um, in verse 7 he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. A uh, key verse to keep in mind as to why we talk about Paul and his the doctrine in Romans through Philemon being a mystery, something new that God had not revealed before, and it's doctrine for us today. Uh, we can't get doctrine for today in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because it wasn't revealed yet. And you get the answer as to why. It's because if God had revealed that he was going to reconcile the heavenly places back to himself, through the church, the body of Christ, then as verse 8 says, the princes of this world, referring to the angels that are under Satan, they would not, if they'd known the mystery, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't realize that by crucify, they thought that crucifying Jesus meant they were, that Satan had won the victory. He killed God, basically, is what they thought, but he didn't. Instead, he allowed God's salvation plan to come to pass. That's why it's a mystery uh, until revealed to the Apostle Paul. Uh, so there. In, uh, so now if we go to chapter 3, uh, we read the first couple of verses earlier where it talks about how they are carnal. And I wrote on your outline, the way to get out of carnality, as I mentioned earlier, is not to take go attack the symptom of, well, I'm drinking too much so I gotta stop drinking or I'm uh, lying too much so I gotta stop lying. It's not that. It's going to the cause of the problem and that's rooted in following the lust of the flesh, following man's doctrine instead of following what God has given. So I've written on your outline there chapter 3 is about learn mystery doctrine to labor for God. Everything else is carnal. Everything else is carnal. And we read about them being carnal there and he talks there down in verse 9, talking about the, divi you know, talking about the divisions of Paul, people following Paul or Par Apollos or Christ, um, following Cephas. They're following those different things. In verse 4 he says, when you do those things, are you not carnal? And then he says down in verse 8, 
Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another, another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So in other words, what he's saying is that God lays the foundation through believing in the shed blood of Jesus Christ as atonement for your sins. So then you're saved. Well then, he's going to build on that. Ephesians 5 talks about that, how Christ is going to sanctify the church through the washing of the water by the uh, word. And so he gives the sound doctrine. And then it's up to you if you're going to uh, labor in that doctrine and believe it, or if you're not. And if you do labor in that doctrine and believe it, uh, then that will take care of the issue of carnality that the Corinthians were experiencing. So they, here they are, they're saying, well, I'm of, a, I'm of Paul. Another one says, I'm of Apollos. And Paul's point is, Paul and Apollos... They're nobody. They're just men just like everybody else. They're nothing special. You know, today we've got, what, 7 billion people in the world. No one person is any better in their flesh than any other person. The, the flesh is uh, weak and you end up sinning regardless of who you are. It's what it, what's the part there that's special. It's not the, the person himself. It's not the flesh, but rather it's the doctrine. God's Sound doctrine for today is what works, builds up the inner man, and then works through you so that you end up doing what Romans says, present your body as a living sacrifice. You end up yielding your members over to God for His service. And so that's his point there in, you know, in verse 9. We're laborers together with God. We're not, Paul isn't any more special than Apollos. He was just, Paul was just given a, he was given a ministry, the dispensation of the grace of God to give out to uh, to the world, but as far as his flesh, not any better. We are all laborers together. And so he's laid the, laid the foundation, and now, once you had that foundation, verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, I put that as one of the key verses, that your inner man foundation is Jesus Christ. Once you have that foundation of being saved, then uh, you build upon that, Faith in Jesus Christ continues. You continue to have faith in God's Word and His doctrine for today in Paul's epistles, and you allow that doctrine to work through you. That's how you build upon the foundation so that you eliminate the carnality, or at least lessen it. And then the verses go on and talks about building on there. At the end then, uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, when we are raptured up and we go up there into heaven, um, we are going to be occupying the positions in heavenly places that Satan and his angels are going to be cast out of due their, to their iniquity. And, and based on what kind of faith we've had in the sound doctrine of Paul's epistles and how much we've learned that and been strengthened in the inner man will determine how much we are able to handle those, uh, those positions there in that structure. And so really learning that mystery doctrine is how you labor for God. It's not going out and doing good works themselves. It's really uh, getting into the doctrine, and, and that's his point there. Is don't follow man, just God is the one who builds up. We are just all laborers, and so we should be, all of us, laboring together in God's Word to learn the doctrine so that we can grow up, build upon that foundation, the gold, silver, precious stones, so that we will have that reward of a position in the heavenly places that God has for us. Uh, so that's chapter 3. And then uh, another verse I put as a key verse down in verse 21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. So that, that's the point is, again, just like he said in um, you know, chapter 1, verse 29, when it comes to your salvation, God does it through the preaching of the cross of Christ, so that the Jews can't glory in God's presence and the Greeks can't glory in God's presence. He does it through the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel. Well, the same thing is, uh, is the case when it comes to overcoming the lust of the flesh, overcoming carnality. It's that 
faith in Jesus Christ will cause you to read the doctrine and believe what he says here in Paul's epistles. The doctrine will work itself out through you as you read, and it's a slow process, which is why I'm encouraging people to read through Paul's epistles uh, throughout the year, because as, as you keep reading them over and over, 